don't touch the mascot. Stop with the Black Lives Matter flag. And then once he said it, he walked away. What was one of the first racist symbols that you saw in this school? The mascot. When you choose the mascot, you really need to do your due diligence around your community and what the mascot is projecting to the rest of the world. What do we want? Justice! Why can we want it? No! Not one more life! Not one more life! Sounds Like Hate is a new podcast series from the Southern Poverty Law Center. I'm Jamila Paxima. And I'm Geraldine Moriba. This first season is about how some people become radicalized and how some disengage from a life of hatred. In the second episode of Not Okay, we return to Randolph Union High School in Vermont, where 95% of the community is white, and students and faculty are caught in the crosshairs of racism. We find out if the Black Lives Matter flag will be raised at the high school and learn how extremist symbols hide in plain sight. At the center of the controversy is a massive mascot in the gym at Randolph Union. Some say it has a disturbing resemblance to a hooded Ku Klux Klansman charging on a horse. I see a couple of churches, train station. Jamila and I were walking through the center of town when a historical society display caught our attention. It says, in 1777, Vermont became the first state in the nation to abolish slavery. Four years later, the town of Randolph was established. The population is about 5,000. Less than 200 are people of color. Today, the streets are quiet and have been for months. And schools, they're closed dealing with clearly an emerging infectious disease that has now reached outbreak proportions and likely pandemic proportions. With the crisis of COVID-19. Then, the video recording capturing the death of George Floyd, a black man killed by police brutality. In Minneapolis, where, as you know, chaos and anger have erupted across the country over the death of George Floyd. Nationwide demonstrations began. Now students and former alumni of Randolph Union High School are defying state orders against large gatherings and planning the town's first racial justice march. We're passing the Randolph Police Department on our way, on our march. Brittany Malik is one of the lead organizers of the We Demand Change protest. We're simply just marching, just walking on the sidewalks through Randolph and just letting our voices be heard. That's all we're doing. She's also a former student at Randolph Union High School. We are not advertising any form of civil disobedience. That is why we are training de-escalators in particular, is to alleviate those kinds of situations so we can just keep this about what the message is. Brittany and the other student organizers plan to march from the school to a park where they will give speeches Hold a moment of silence for victims of racism and sing. My face turned to the sun. Brittany and co organizer Jenea Hudson are practicing one of the songs they Way intend to shoulder. use to rally the marchers. The song is called Stand Up. It's by Cynthia Arrivo from the movie motion picture Harriet. The lyrics tell the story of Harriet Tubman, an abolitionist who guided slaves north to freedom. The message is to strive for liberty and keep on going, even if you have to do it alone. Before the sun begins to shine. The song is just about her standing up and making a way for them to go. The strength that I got until I die. So I'm gonna stand up. In 2015, when Brittany was still a student at Randolph Union, she was the only Black person in her grade. It was mind-boggling, to say the least. One day, the racist connotations of the school's mascot, the Galloping Ghost, became all too real. I was, like, struck silent. I can't see anyone else who's feeling like me. Fear, isolation, confusion. This moment forever left a mark 
when suddenly more than 24 athletic team captains charged into the gym. They're galloping in on broomsticks and they're all, all of them are wearing white sheets over their heads. What is happening? Like, does nobody else see this horde of white sheeted people running into this room? Like, is no one else freaking out right now? With so few students of color at the high school, racism tends to show up as normalized expressions, like the stampede Brittany experienced. Other times, as deliberate hate. I would get left out a lot, and there's some harmful words that were said to me. So I told my mom, and then she taught me what the words meant, and some people have different views on people who are different colors. What is your background? I'm part Indian. East Indian, to be specific. Amir, who is in the ninth grade, will make a sign, wear a mask, and attend the We Demand Change protest with Brittany. He says he experiences racial attacks routinely at school. There's a lot. I don't know if I can even keep track. What's a lot? Like more than five. In each different year, it's happened. When you go to school, do you think school is a safe or a frightening place? It depends on what happens in the day. Sign in, guys. Sign in. On our first trip to Vermont in February of 2020, before the pandemic, we arrive at Randolph Union High School. Almost everything seems familiar. The morning begins with a few late stragglers rolling into the school office. My name's Elijah Hawks, and I'm principal here at Randolph Union. And we can see the high school gym ahead of us. Looks principal like Hawks led us towards the gymnasium. This is where we have our volleyball games, basketball games, gym classes. It's We've come game. to see the mural of the mascot. We have the, the mural of the mascot on the wall that's 15 feet by 20 feet. That's been a source of much conversation in the school in the last few years. We have a cloaked rider on a horse, both of them white and gray. The horse is charging forcefully. It almost looks like charging forcefully into the gym. The rider looks ghostly, ghoulish, mystical, mythical. So the mascot issue was also brought up in the beginning of my 12th grade year when the class, the racial justice class, started. Zai Buska, a senior at the time, says his racial justice class was deeply concerned about the message the mascot was projecting, but they were already overwhelmed trying to raise the Black Lives Matter flag. We knew whatever we chose would be a whole year commitment, and the conversation was brought up about the mascot. When we were deciding on what we are going to focus on, we eventually chose the Black Lives Matter flag. Zai knew both issues were inflammatory. Almost immediately, he received a warning from a parent at the end of a school soccer match. We watched out the game, and the game ended, and we started to walk away. And one of the parents who was watching the game came up to me and said, don't continue your work you're doing. Don't touch the mascot. And, like, stop with the Black Lives Matter flag. And then once he said it, he walked away. I didn't even, like, get a word out. Never experienced anything like that from a parent in the community. Did it feel intimidating? It, it for sure was intimidating. That didn't stop Zai. He reported the threat to Principal Hawks and the teachers in the racial justice class. He and his classmates continued their work to raise the Black Lives Matter flag. So after a full semester of that kind of teaching through advisories, they came and presented at a faculty meeting. Despite community resistance, they gained support from some students, faculty, and parents. And then I said, after you've done a good deal of dialogue and movement building here at the school, then let me hear your rationale. They did that. By January of 2019, Principal Hawks made his decision. At an assembly to commemorate Martin Luther King Day, six students took center stage. They explained the meaning of the Black Lives Matter flag and how it represented their own experiences. We all have personally seen and heard instances of racial slurs. A teacher recorded the presentation. The majority of the school does not identify as minority. Zai remembers how enormous this accomplishment was. It was like a moment for us to finally be like, whoa. 
like our work actually got somewhere, like it paid off. The words we are about to share are disgusting and represent the hate people in their school experience every day. Illegal. How did you make it over the wall? These words and comments have made to divide us, pin against one another, hurt and tear each other down. During my speech, the parent who came up to me and told me to stop doing the things I was doing was standing there watching us give the presentation. So it was kind of like a big relief factor being like, like I showed you. The only way we progress as humanity is by working together as one on our problems in society so one day we can all strive for equality. Thank you. When the applause ended, Principal Hawks announced the Black Lives Matter flag would not only be raised, it would be flown all year round. I'm happy it went up. After the Black Lives Matter flag was raised, school superintendent Lane Millington worried his community still wasn't ready to tackle the galloping ghost mascot. The hope for what it could have achieved had those conversations um, actually been real conversations and not push people further into their own camps, I, I feel that that was a loss. I wasn't very happy about it. Caden and Grace, a little frustrated because two eighth graders, were in the assembly that day. I was pretty ticked off. I almost felt, I don't want to say left out as a white person, but I feel like we kind of like are taking it really far. I would have wanted to say all lives matter, not just black lives matter. I'm making th- little things into really big deals. If they're going to make a big deal about the flag and all of that, I think they need to change the mascot. I potentially have a fire here that can devolve into violence. Do I really want to be throwing more rocket fuel on it at this point in time? I would say that every year since I've been here, some folks have remarked on how similar it looks to to a KKK rider. Tev Kelman teaches history at the school. Our mascot is the Galloping Ghost and has been, to my understanding, since the 1940s or 1950s. And The Galloping Ghost mascot has had dozens of versions, but it hasn't changed since 1988 when Kelman started teaching there. It was coined by a sports writer, a native son of Randolph named Aldo Marusi. It's on the face of nearly every wall clock in every classroom. There is no missing it. It grabs your attention. He was referring to the fact that they're wearing white uniforms and they're galloping down the court so fast. So that was the sort of origin story of this mascot. Someone in Burlington or Montpelier had mentioned to me, oh, have you seen the the mascot at the high school in Randolph? And I said, no, I haven't. Curtis Reed is the executive director of the Vermont Partnership on Fairness and Diversity. They took an entire wall. There's a large mural. He received complaints about Randolph Union's mascot and fired off an email to Principal Hawks. This looks like it came right out of Klan history. Curtis was the first to juxtapose for me an an image from the film The Birth of a Nation of a hooded rider on a hooded horse. The Birth of a Nation is a notorious and disturbing racist film made in 1915 by D.W. Griffith. It's a three-hour black-and-white silent film set during the Civil War and Reconstruction. It features white actors in blackface violently playing out awful stereotypes. The film chronicles a twisted story about how Blacks stole an election and all the seats in Congress, and how Southern Klansmen saved the day. Geraldine, have you seen this film? Unfortunately, I have. This film is Confederate-soaked propaganda celebrating slavery. It's a part of the distorted pseudo-historical lost cause narrative of the Confederacy. In scene after scene, hooded men in white robes gallop and kill almost every Black person by gunshot. What's problematic is the imagery that shows the galloping ghost. And that imagery is so closely linked to the Klan as to be sort of disconcerting to me. At the opening of the 2018 school year, during another assembly, Principal Hawks did something unexpected. 
He projected a massive image of a hooded Ku Klux Klan knight from the Birth of a Nation film poster right next to the mural of the galloping ghost. I felt an obligation to continue that conversation with people in our school and to do it when I had the mic. I think it was a big eye-opener for people. Zai recalls that day. It was like very, very similar. The same exact pose and everything of a ghost, like a caped figure riding um, a horse, a white horse. Some people were very taken aback. Um, Seeing the images was, was shocking for some people. His message was simple. It was time to stop holding on to this tradition and acknowledge the mascot's racist associations. Not everyone thought it was a good idea. People who thought that it was a terrible way to start a school year and an inappropriate way to start a school year and unprofessional and some people who very strongly thought I should resign or be fired. As the debates about the Black Lives Matter flag and mascot increased, so did the number of incidents with hateful messages, symbols, and racial slurs around the school. We had an assembly. One of our community members, a local pastor in town, was sharing his remarks and touched upon the Holocaust. And one of our teachers observed one of our students making the upside down OK symbol at the time that the pastor was saying those remarks. When I was in school, we'd play this game where, you know, the OK symbol below your waist. If somebody looks at it, you punch them in the arm. Corey Collins is a senior writer at Teaching Tolerance with the Southern Poverty Law Center. He says the upside down OK sign now stands as a symbol of white power. The OK symbol begins as essentially a troll. So someone on one of these chat boards, you know, is like, what if we make this in to a white power symbol? Like we claim that this is a white power symbol and we see if the media picks it up. The line between this being a joke and this being a serious nod to white supremacy or to white nationalism becomes very blurred. It becomes hard to say that it's just a joke. Principal Hawks turned to Cynthia Miller Idris for advice. You know, um, she's the director of the Polarization and Extremism Research and Innovation Lab at American University. Times change and awareness of what symbols mean. And you can do some educational work with the community and help them understand why this is an offensive symbol. Miller Idris has spent years studying how schools in Germany tackled their racist history and the rising tide of neo-Nazi messages and symbols. It doesn't usually work very effectively to just ban or shut down those symbols without a kind of pedagogical conversation with students. But I think it's important for educational environments, for school environments, for communities to understand that they can be effective for everybody else. Germany is doing things better than we are here in terms of engaging educators in the conversation about young people and the risks of them being radicalized. Principal Hawks's goal is to have every student at Randolph Union participate in small circle advisory lessons on hate symbols, the way they did in Germany. What happened in Germany is obviously you have the history of the Holocaust, but then you had this very strong second wave of extremism emerge in the 1980s and 90s among young people. The government reacted with really comprehensive engagement to prevent and interrupt radicalization pathways. So they have in every level of schooling, trainings for teachers, workshops, retreats, the equivalent of what we would think of as mental health hotline or suicide or sexual assault hotlines. They have those kinds of resources across the society. So they do draw a line in the sand. They tell a community what its values are, what we stand for, what we won't tolerate. I'm just playing a game with my friends. And that's all I see it as. Grace, an eighth grader, quickly became frustrated by the advisory lesson. If other people see it as me being racist, that's not how I'm putting it out to be. I'm just playing a game with my friends. Corey Collins says this is exactly the point, manipulating common symbols. These symbols certainly are not going away at all. So at Teaching Tolerance, we keep track of hate incidents across the country. We are still seeing actually an increase in the amount of swastikas carved into desks or carved into bathroom stalls. It illustrates that they are open, which tells me that they could be sent down that wormhole of 
online radicalization. We know the internet can send them to really dark places. So I think, yeah, you have to be hyper vigilant. Just tell us your name, where we are in the school, and what your role is. Um, my name is Eileen Snow. Um, we are currently in the media center at the high school, and I am the assistant librarian. Snow is proud to be a member of the Ghost Nation. She grew up in Randolph, went to school here, and has collected eight this decades of yearbooks. This one here is just scary. She showed us different iterations of the Galloping Ghost. This one's 95. This one's 1981 all of which, she says, are innocent. And this one here, it's more of a skeleton with a cape. Would that be a hood or a cape? To me, it's a cape. Does it look like a ghost? No, it looks like a skeletor. Look, wearing a cape. <laughs> okay. And the horse looks more real. The Klan had a strong presence in Vermont in the 1920s and into the 1930s. Although. History teacher Kelman also met with us in the library to talk about the prevalence of the KKK in the 1920s. Something like four million members of the Ku Klux Klan nationwide at that time period. And there was a chapter in central Vermont of which Randolph is a part. Records show there were 30 active Klan members in the Randolph chapter in 1916, and a total of 2,000 Vermont Klan members who held picnics and cross burnings between the 1920s and 1940s. While there is no definitive link between the KKK and the original image of the school mascot, Teacher Kelman has his own theory about why it was never challenged. In time and space of an active Klan membership, in the 1920s to this mascot in the 1940s it helps at least for me to explain why it was not seen as problematic. There were probably people who had family members who were clan members. Back then, the primary KKK targets were Catholic immigrants. 1924, and the Ku Klux Klan experiencing a nationwide revival begins a membership drive in Vermont. This is an oral history recording captured by the Vermont Historical Museum. For ten dollars, they could become a member. They burned a lot of crosses. The people who were in it said that it was fun to have a burning cross and everybody gather under it and sing. Sometimes they were burned to scare people, just for sensationalism, I suppose. Oh, the clan! Oh, the clan! It falls on every red blood fighting man. We had a student here who started the petition of the students to get it changed. Snow, the assistant librarian, says a 10th grader turned to her for help. He was very um, offended by it. This student said the mascot compounded the weight of verbal taunting and racist slurs used against him. At a school where they had a shooting scare, he feared for his own safety and other students. And he wanted to go and literally paint the gym wall himself. And I talked to him from doing vandalism down to doing the proper channels. And so he started a petition and he got several kids to sign it. And Jamila, how successful was this petition? This student wouldn't speak to us on the record, but he did confirm collecting 250 signatures from students and faculty. I don't know where that petition lies now. In January of 2020, the student left Randolph Union and enrolled in another school. I think part of why he left was he, he's a student of color and, I, and he wanted to be in a district where there were more students of color, where he already had friends who were students of color. So are there other schools in the U.S. with mascots resembling the KKK? In fact, Geraldine, yes. I found two other schools that share the offensive imagery of the galloping ghost. Why would you hurt children? That's Eric Ward, a senior fellow at the Southern Poverty Law Center and the executive director of Western State Center. It's not how we strengthen our ties to one another. He works nationwide to foster inclusive democracy in all areas of life, work, and schools. 
us pretending that a man wearing a white sheet on a horse riding through the night doesn't parallel racist imagery, doesn't frighten children or make them feel uncomfortable, isn't how we strengthen community. Randolph Union is just one of many schools in the U.S. with racist mascots. Kakana High School in Wisconsin is in discussions about their galloping ghost mascot and statue outside their school. And students at Abington High School in Pennsylvania started a Change.org petition to remove their galloping ghost mascot, and the school district has plans for their equity committee to address the issue. Eric Ward says... There's a price for resisting change. It is a way of sowing division because you think you want to get one over, you know, on the liberals in society. But all you're really doing is hurting children who are your neighbors. I don't think that it's a racist symbol. History teacher Kelman is also the vice president of the local faculty union. I believe the origin story. The vast majority of the people who feel very attached to it, I don't think that those people have racial animus or or racist feeling behind that. But I do think that the impact has been extremely harmful to kids of color. And that's why it needs to go. I think Kelman initiated a letter from the faculty firmly demanding the removal of the Galloping Ghost mascot. The view that um, folks who signed the letter shared is that there are issues which merit and deserve and are appropriate for a public discussion with all stakeholders. This is not one of those issues because the issue of student safety cannot be weighed against other people's preferences. 10, 11 years ago, I walked in and I was like, that's an interesting mascot. Teacher Dana Decker co-leads the racial justice class at Randolph Union. Like, we're not going to allow the kids to take on all of the hard work and the hate. It's up to us to start the conversation. I read the email. Librarian Snow, who supported the student petition, bucked at the request to sign the letter from the faculty. I'm like, not signing I live in this community. I'm going to stay Switzerland neutral. My son was a galloping ghost. I was one. My parents were. It's a ghost. A vast majority of people do not see anything wrong with that symbol. But I also understand that the vast majority of those people are white people who may not have the life experience or the family history to appreciate how damaging that symbol can be. Out of 46 faculty members, 23 signed the letter. We, the undersigned faculty and staff... Decker read an excerpt for us. Respectfully but firmly demand the removal of the Galloping Ghost mural, and we call for a new school mascot that is no way connotes racist or white supremacist imagery. But before the teachers could present it to the school superintendent, Lane Millington, and Principal Hawks, their letter was leaked. There's now hundreds of messages of like a real life witch hunt. I wasn't anticipating that we were going to be posted on Facebook. The following comments are real posts read by actors. I really hate you for actually doing your jobs. Good thing you guys are focused on social activism and creating monsters where there are none. You're allowing a kid to call us racist? Get a backbone, y'all. This is race baiting. The mascot looks like a ghost on a galloping horse. I thought this was history. Within hours, school superintendent Lane Millington heard about the Facebook flurry. I don't want to to denigrate the teachers at all because I firmly am in agreement with their their feelings on the matter. The piece that I could have helped them with um, significantly was the recognition that we have some dug-in camps in this town that if you are not extremely careful about how this unfolds, they are going to dig in even harder, they're going to get angrier, and there may be violence. This battle is hard. It's not like... 
We want to start a fight in this community. We just want everyone to feel safe. And these students that come in here and are constantly called the N-word and are constantly ridiculed and made fun of and called animal names and treated as slaves is not okay. Rather than tear this community apart, I'm going to cut to the end and make a decision. The next day, Superintendent Millington responded with his own letter to the community. The image of the galloping ghost in the field house will be removed. Murals coming down, that image is done. We will go back to the old image from 1955 that had been up since the beginning of the whole galloping ghost idea, which is innocuous. It's a, it's a skeleton on a horse. To the teachers who wrote the faculty letter, this was neither innocuous nor a solution. It's a cloaked skeleton on a horse. Our demand was a mascot that in no way resembles a racist symbol. Personally, if it had been my decision, I might have gone for a much cleaner break from the past. Honestly, the galloping ghost has already tainted <laughs> the school. We just have to talk about it and come, you know, come up with a way to where we're all feeling safe, right? I'm not crazy about symbols of death being used in educational spaces in general, but I you Miller know, Idris of American University says due diligence is lacking in the superintendent's decision. I don't think it's a great one to to move from a symbol of racism to one that is, you know, a symbol of death. I've seen recent groups in the US like Adam Waffen, the base, use this symbol of the skeleton face as a mask. Symbols of death, it includes skulls and crossbones. You know, they were used on um, Nazi insignia. They are used on these masks that the extreme far-right fringe uses in the States. They provoke fear and, um, you know, and even a sense of threat. In the spring of 2020, the Galloping Ghost mascot was painted over in the gym, and its image on all the school clocks will be replaced. The Black Lives Matter flag will remain despite opposition. So we're here in Elijah Hawks's garage doing an interview during the pandemic. It's now mid-June, and Geraldine and I have returned to Vermont. Students and teachers haven't gathered for class, proms, or any other activities due to COVID-19 local orders. This is a first. We're keeping our social distance. Thank you for doing the interview. First for me, too. The school never got to develop their new mascot, and the advisory lessons were shelved. You have some former students who are now organizing a march. And they're doing this because they actually don't think enough is being done in this community to address racism. I'm grateful and ready to act on those demands. It's appropriate to demand that. There's a need. Absolutely. Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! The next day, we arrived at the Randolph We Demand Change March. I spotted Amir, the ninth grader. We're at the peaceful protest in Randolph by RUHS. Not one more life! He's endured years of repeated racial taunting at the school. His sign, it says, we matter too. How do you feel right now at the, looking at this crowd that's growing? I feel really safe and happy with other people protesting with me. Three hundred mostly white allies showed up to support the students of color, alumni, and organizers. They marched peacefully down the five blocks of Main Street in Randolph. Every lamppost they pass is decorated with an American flag or a Vermont state flag. I asked the staff members and uh, administrators. Zai Buska, a co-leader of the march and a recent high school graduate, addressed the protesters gathered in a large semicircle in the park. I noticed through my two years of being invested in the fight of equality that this fight never ends. He reminded the crowd of the foundational work the students did at Randolph Union High School to raise 
the Black Lives Matter flag. We are going to see change in our community and change in our systematic racist society that we live in because some white Americans finally see the fact that Black Lives Matter. And Brittany spoke about the student demands. We are demanding a change to our curriculum to reflect accurate depictions of our nation's disgraceful history. This young man just approached when all of the marchers and demonstrators were asked to lie down. During eight minutes and 46 seconds of extended silence representing the time George Floyd was restrained and died during his arrest, a man shows up blaring heavy metal music and carrying a red duffel bag. It appeared to us he intended to disrupt the moment. And I looked up and saw this guy. um, Teacher Kelman and Brittany say it was scary. But he was like walking down the path, getting closer to where there were a bunch of people. I just had to physically and mentally repeat to myself, do not turn around. I am terrified. I am scared. He reached into his bag and pulled out nunchucks and started swinging them. Just swinging his nunchucks around. Everything is okay, you are okay, we are okay. And just repeating that over and over to myself as we got through that situation. Some of the de-escalators have gone out looking for him, just sort of escorting him away from the crowd. Thankfully for everyone gathered, the disruption was handled by Teacher Kelman and the de-escalators. That's when I'm gonna stand up, take my people with me. As the protest is winding down, I'm standing with Amir, talking to him about the song we are hearing. These words mean to me that... Talking about people that are feeling pain and what they have to go through and showing that you're not alone. And if we keep going at the same pace as we are now, we won't have a future. So we have to work together so we can succeed in justice. It is time to lift one another up. Eric Ward says supporting voices like Amir's and other students is our best chance at solving bigotry and racism. If we can't lift up our own children in our communities, how are we to stand by one another as Americans? We don't invest in our children by investing bigotry. We invest by investing hope. At the end of the event, I ran into Principal Hawk standing in the back wearing a James Baldwin t-shirt. Is this what dialogue looks like? There's honesty here today, and that's an essential element of what dialogue looks like. And I think there's listening here today. All right. Thank you to Randolph Union High School, its staff and families for allowing us to tell their story. Many times, racists and the institutions they defend do so under the guise of freedom. They make us doubt ourselves and the work being done to build a safer world by stoking fears that we are all losing our freedoms. They are wrong. Sounds Like Hate are stories about people who engage in extremism and hold on to lies and how they disengage from a life of hate. Baseless is our next two-part story. We analyze secret recordings about an international extremist organization and find out revealing details about how they recruit young men into one of the most dangerous white supremacist groups in the U.S. today. I told them I'm a Nazi. I have an AR-15. I'd be willing to defend my ideas with violent force. You seem smart. Yeah, I give him a thumbs up, yeah. 
These are complicated stories about people who hold on to false histories and terroristic ideologies and draw boundaries that are skin deep. If you or anyone you know has experienced a hate incident or crime, please contact the appropriate local authority or elected official. You can also document what happened at splcenter.org slash report hate. This is Sounds Like Hate, an independent documentary podcast series brought to you by the Southern Poverty Law Center. Additional funding provided by the Ring Foundation. I'm Jamila Paxima. And I'm Geraldine Moriba. If you find this podcast interesting, then subscribe to find out when new episodes are released. And remember to rate and review. It really helps. Thank you for listening.